Hello, welcome to another episode of the Philip Wiley Show. Today, I'm very excited to have uh, my friend uh, Maxie Reynolds joining. Maxie was on my podcast, The Hacker Factory, probably the first year that I was running it. But uh, it's interesting. We've been connected on social media for years, but we finally yeah. got to to meet in person during Hacker Summer Camp last week. And so mm -hmm. I have to say she's more amazing in person than, than you would think. So uh, good to finally get to meet you. I didn't even pay you to say that. That was nice. Thank you. Good to meet you. It was really <laughs> nice to meet you. It was fun. Yeah, it's one of the highlights of my summer camp. So we it was I good was to get to, to hang out for a little bit. And so because there's too fun. many people, too many people that you want to meet that you yeah. didn't have time to meet it meet up with, and some people you didn't get to meet. So so it worked out great. It, it, it did work out great. And it was very haphazard between us. I think you were standing somewhere in somewhere in my vicinity at a bar. Mm -hmm. um and someone said oh there's Phil and I was like Wiley and then I <laughs> trotted over and <laughs> here we are but it, no it was really nice it was really nice yeah it's great great to get to meet you I was really surprised I didn't know that you're going to be there and uh yeah it was it was good to see Sam and Marcus as well yes it was I I spent a lot of time with that whole crew and I don't have COVID, so it's <laughs> good. shocking. Yeah, <laughs> yes, um, but we digress. I yeah, do. so why don't, for the folks that probably don't know of you, that may not know of you, yeah. we have a lot of people that are just getting started or trying to get started, if you don't mind kind of sharing mm -hmm. your background, your hacker not origin story. Yeah. Okay, so it's sort of, uh, I'll try to be succinct, let's see. So I actually started out sort of very late teens, working offshore oil and gas as an ROV pilot technician, which is sort of a technical job offshore. And I ended up with that job because I was like undereducated. I left home and school at like 15, too, too young, too early. And I didn't really have a lot going for me, but I also had this mindset from very young, like I didn't want to be where I was. I wanted to do something else. So I needed a job that you could travel with and get paid for. And I applied for some really embarrassing jobs. So I think when I was 16, and I, I think this is the first time I've ever said this out loud actually. When I was about 16, I applied to be a Disney princess. So like, it wasn't a straight path, but um, a lot of the two members of my family, my granddad and my stepdad worked offshore. So I went my my granddad had long retired. So I went to my dad and said, would you help me get a job offshore? And he said, no. <laughs> and if he'd have just said yes, I might have backed off, but he didn't. So I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. And I got a lot of help from a lot of other people around me. And I ended up educated in like robotics, underwater robotics. Fast forward, I ended up offshore and I really enjoyed the job. I worked there like on oil rigs, platforms, things like that for almost 10 years and then when you work offshore you get a month on you get a month off but when you're on it's really like a nice like high-ish quality prison you're there you get fed you get free time and so 12 hours of your day you can really do what you want with but you know that's fine for the first month but then after that you're like well what can I do so I'd racked up a few long distance degrees and I was like educated in computer science of all things. So I ended up working for PwC in Australia. The daily offshore had started to drop. I wasn't finding quite as much fun in it anymore. And I'd been like living in Los Angeles and doing some other work in stunts and things like that. And I was just ready for a little bit of a change. So I moved down to Australia, started as a very old sort of 30 year old graduate for PwC and they taught me logical hacking. And it was like a brand new world and I'd done some idiotic things down there that I'm glad I'm not in prison for. Um, they weren't illegal, I was just kind of dumb. So like I shut off an entire city's like water supply, um, things like that. So not always the smartest, but it was a lot of fun and it taught me a lot. And they had like basically social social engineering and red teaming combined within our cyber team. So I got to see and try that too. Fast forward a couple of years, my visa was up. So I came to back to America and I started a small company that catered to like high 
net worth high profile individuals and I was doing some uh, red teaming things like that but I this was my first time running a business and I couldn't quite make it work I wasn't you know it wasn't rolling um and it was just me and it was probably too much then I went to work someplace else in the industry as a social engineer and from that I actually got a lot of opportunity so I wrote a book for Wiley it was very like uh, in a short amount of time like in eight weeks I wrote this book and then I felt a few there was a few sort of intersecting I guess conditions or variables that came together and I moved from cybersecurity through to back to subsea engineering and so now I've got a company that takes data centers and puts them into water so that was really long so I hope you were able to follow <laughs> oh I can't hear you yeah that, that's that's awesome so the the stunt thing so you were a stunt woman for a while yeah I was a stunt not a very good one like but yes, I was. I, I worked for some like independent little movies. I worked at some of the studios. So I was like very close to fulfilling my dream of being a Disney princess because I worked at the studios. <laughs> but <laughs> oh, God. Would, would um, have been a, a, a badass Disney princess if you're doing yeah, There we go. That's right. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Um, I think we really need a Disney princess like that to show show <laughs> girls and young women that you're not, you know, tied to the stereotypes that you see. You know what? I think like in today's society, in today's culture or cultural backdrop, there's this tendency to, to want to see like there's ultra feminism and it's like, we, we want to believe that, we've been held back and i think that we have like we absolutely have it's it's this is the best time it's ever been to be a woman and that's saying quite a lot um but it's always been worse and we actually have the best of it now so whatever you want to do as a female like try go try do it and see how far you get and one of the things that i sort of learned the further and further i'm getting into my 30s is that it's not just willpower that matters it's very important and you absolutely require that it's this willpower and strategy combined you can't do everything via brute force so you will need help and you'll need a little bit of strategy but i think once you've come to terms with that women we can do whatever we want to do we can do whatever yeah. we want to do for the most part, I couldn't be a fireman, not not yeah. with the, any amount of strategy or <laughs> or <laughs> willpower, but like whatever you want to do, you can. Well, that's really really good too. That there there's not really limitations out there. Some some cases there yeah. are, but you can find organizations and, and places that are open minded. But yes. it's really kind of cool. Some of the things you've chosen, like yeah. being a stunt woman working offshore, because <laughs> I'm sure. I can't, how many, did you run into very many women doing offshore work? I did not run into any women doing offshore work. Um, and I didn't notice. I was too young. There wasn't, there wasn't the attitude that there is today in my culture. Like we weren't talking about women in the workplace. We weren't talking about any of those things. So I really, I hadn't been turned on to it to see that maybe there was some mistreatment or that there was places we'd been held back. I didn't know. So it didn't stop me. And I'm lucky in most ways it's sort of a trait that goes for me and against me that if I'm told no and I want to do it well I'll just do it anyway and I'll find like the the path around the person saying no or like chip away <laughs> at all of their like confidence um, and, and still find a way so I don't know if that is born from my like initial conditions I don't know if that's a genetic trait but whatever it is for the most part is quite helpful and I think it can definitely be taught I think it's it's a mindset that can be can be taught so what is it like to, I mean the second time around starting a business because before yeah. you said it didn't work out so yeah. uh, what's the second time around like did you learn a lot of lessons from your first business I learned a lot of lessons from my first business for sure, but none that I could really pass on. They, they're too specific. They're too anecdotal. I have a, a different mindset now and I'm all, just age. Age is also helpful. And what I learned from starting 
that company all the way through until a couple of years ago when I started this one is to ask for help. So like I ask for help from the people around me. I get good ideas. I don't feel bad about that. I don't feel like, well, I'm like not smart for, for not knowing the answer. And so I actually end up with a lot of good advice. I think most people around me are way smarter than me. I'm fairly book smart. I read a lot and I can remember a lot, but none of it is, it doesn't seem to be um, natural for me. So, but I'm okay with that now. I surround myself with people who are really smart and strategic. Yeah, it's really interesting when you mention that because, you know, there's the ways, you know, I look at different people and, and I've taught before, but you see some people and it's really interesting and admirable to see people that are genius that pick stuff up so easily and learn yeah. so well. But the gifted aren't always the successful because sometimes when it comes real easy, they're not really pushed and motivated. But you take someone else that that yeah. works harder. A lot, a lot of cases, there's usually a better outcome than than the people yeah. that were gifted in that area. I hope so. I mean, I think being an outlier in one way or the other is like it has its has its pros and cons and wherever I'm an outlier, I'm sort of happy with, I'm comfortable with now. And that's probably a big part of it, getting a little bit more comfortable with yourself as you run a company knowing you don't need all the answers, it's okay to ask for help, that yes, there's willpower, but there's also strategy. And like the biggest thing, like my biggest thing for running a business is actually problem solving. That is exactly what my job is now. It could be the problem that I've created the day before. It could be a problems that I have nothing to do with, but I simply have to solve. And I think that's actually a lot of businesses. And once you're comfortable with that, you know, go for it. You're, you're, you can go at full speed. So, and to have a good company, you have to be solving a problem. Like you have to see something in the market that needs solved or created to solve something. You identify and you work towards that solution. And like, that's the big secret. You can have multiple solutions for a given problem. And we might all think, we might all sort of think that ours is the, the, the paragon, the, the, the solution of all solutions. But ultimately, I think you, it's as you analyze your solution, it is the utility delta versus the currency of that times the number of people who can help. So have a solution that is far more helpful than what we have now or solve something that we have now and look at the amount of people that will help. Now, we live in a very digital age, obviously. We're the most connected and most interconnected that we've ever, that we've ever been and trends tend to continue. So the company I founded and run, we essentially are solving a problem for a lot of people we think and we hope and the market will decide like the markets are typically efficient as long as they converge on the right opinion i mean they're not perfect but they are efficient so mentioning the the problem solving skills and that kind of being one of your strengths so yeah. with your company what problem were you problems were you trying to solve good question so here's sort of how the company started um and it like wasn't brilliant, but essentially, I we talked about red teaming before, and I'd gone into data centers, and it was just a thought of as I walked through one that we'd broken into, and you know we to go in through like sewers and things like that. I thought to myself, God, if you want to really keep them physically secure, put them underwater. And as that sort of grew a little bit, that thought, but that that was really it. That was the the brilliance, I suppose. Um, and I use that term loosely. It's what people think is a really good idea. And at first, I thought the problem that we were solving was the cooling costs. So if you put something into water, like a data center, the cooling costs are cut by about forty percent. And that's as much as I thought of it. But actually, what we have now is we take these state centers, we put them subsea, about 800 servers at a time, 0.5 to 1.5 megawatts, and we can come back to megawatts in a second because they aren't exactly an intuitive metric. And by placing them subsea, we do eliminate the electrically driven cooling. So we see a 40% reduction in the power consumed. But we also see about 750 tons of carbon that are never emitted 
because for every megawatt hour that you use, about half a ton of carbon is created. But I had no idea of that at the time. This was like a big learning curve. And so um, those are the, the main problems and latency for people. So the closer you are to a data center, like the faster you get the information, it's just a product of how fast light travels really in the fiber optic cables. So we solve that challenge. And then for, from a company's point of view, like maybe an Oracle or an Amazon, those sorts of people or companies, they need land to build on and we're running out of it. So what happens is you end up putting your data centers further and further away from the populations that use them. As you do that, like you have to buy the land, that's expensive. You have to get the power and connection there. There's complexities in that, in that you have to do it through manual labor. You have different landowners to go through. It's extremely time and like, time intensive and costly. And so we solved all of that for, for business. Um, and then just to go back for a second to put megawatts into perspective, the average house in the US uses maybe, let's say just under a megawatt per month. And the, like a small average data center maybe uses one to two megawatt hours of electricity per day. So in a larger data center with like high performance compute needs, AI, things like that, they might use several times that amount. And a megawatt hour is, you can cut this out, but a megawatt hour is basically one megawatt per hour. So running at 24 hours a day. So a small data center might use 24 megawatt hours in a day. And your home has used about 33 kilowatt hours. Like it doesn't quite add up that we're using our little devices and thinking nothing of it, but it has, a lot of like negative externalities and we are trying to get around them for the for the sake of the planet and i guess the next question is going to be well mm -hmm. are you heating up the 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 ocean and we actually it's like a really intense sticking point for us because it's extremely hard to educate the population on specific heat essentially i don't know if you want to go into that but i guess sure, the yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> the the like the summation of it is that we don't heat up water. Um, water warms up more, far more slowly than air. So we consider air a fluid, and obviously water is too. And water is like eight hundred times denser than air. So like keep that in mind. Just it's sort of that's almost intuitive. But what happens is the specific heat of water is higher than most other substances. So like said another way, water needs four times as much energy to raise its temperature by one degree as the same mass of air does. So what we've measured in our testing is that water heats up by less than one thousandth of a degree, which is statistically insignificant. And we'll obviously continue to, to test and monitor that. So you put this megawatt of heat, essentially, this this module of ours into the water, and it's about it's running about a megawatt at any given minute, right? It's pulling a megawatt. It doesn't actually heat up the surrounding water. The the ocean is like a or water is a really good heat sink, essentially. If I take that same data center and I just put it onto the beach, it warms up the air and it matters to the entire environment um so it's like hard to educate people on that it's hard to get them to believe no 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 we're not heating up the ocean we're not killing the fish those sorts of things that's our biggest that's my biggest problem to solve day-to-day -day currently yeah that's very interesting so how from a cost perspective uh, yeah. how is the expenses of that compared to the traditional traditional data center you know what's interesting we have we are like probably too cheap i actually think it works against us you know sometimes you're looking at something on i don't know like amazon or something and one's ten dollars and one's 25 and you think is the one at ten dollars not good like why is it so cheap and, and it sort of plays psychologically with you so we are 80 percent less expensive in terms of um 
cap it. So to get one megawatt up and running on land is about $7 million. And for us, we're about $900,000 for, for the same megawatt, but we're putting it subsea and it comes down to bill of materials. We don't have HVAC systems. Um, there's just no like land costs, thing like that. And then to run, we're about 30% less expensive because we could be 40 if we if we wanted to make no profit, we could be 40. But it's when you put this into the water, right, you cut the amount of electricity needed by 40% because you have no cooling costs. We just keep a little bit of that saving so we're a profitable comp company. Yeah, that's very interesting. And, and some of the things I would think when we look at like climate change and stuff and all the fires, that this would be probably a little more safe than your traditional data center, especially when you figure yeah. California that's always seeing these forest fires. Yes. Yeah. It's, you know, that is something we all have to think about. And, you know, climate change is really interesting. Obviously, it's terrible. But it's interesting in that we have finally like concluded that it's real. Like there's like the widespread acceptance of the sobering reality that there is climate change and there are very few climate deniers, at least that I come across in my echo chambers. Um, but what would like be complementary to that uh, sentiment now? is if we could stop a lot of the misinformation and sort of direct the type of advances needed and a shared acknowledgement of the, I guess, material realities of the world. So putting data centers underwater is, is one. It's probably not the one to start with. And I say that, you know, sadly, but it probably isn't. But you are right. We put them underwater. We are protected physically. It's very hard to break into a subsea data center. Even if you're a scuba diver, we can bury them under the seabed. Also, we can put them below the reach of divers and we can put them below the reach of most submarines. Now, the Russians have some very advanced submarines um, and we might not be able to stay out the way of all of them, but for the most part, we can stay out the way of, of, uh, of most of them. And the other thing that that probably springs to mind, which is like, uh, we don't, I don't want to appear tone deaf, but um, Titan, the Titan sub, it brings that to mind for most people. So, so engineering wise, there are two ways to allow something to incur the pressure of water. And it, you can make the walls very thick and you can compensate from the inside. So we compensate from the inside. We're essentially immersion cooled. So we have these, they look like 20 foot shipping containers. We place like 16 racks in there, 800 servers, and it's hermetically sealed. And we, for the most part, um, and we push in this fluid. And so the servers are completely surrounded in that. Hmm. That's obviously not what happened in the Titan sub. That was extremely like from what you can if you look at the pictures there are a few things that as a subsea engineer you know are missing um and again i'm like it's a rough time to talk about it but we are not that we are not using that technology if you can see that um and it's sad but it it sort of is what it is that was I'm, sur I'm very surprised it managed any journeys into war. Very interesting. Yeah. So yeah, it's, that's pretty cool. I used to be a, a system administrator. I used to rack lots of servers and administer yeah. servers. So it's kind of interesting to to see it all evolve into we something like that. We could use you if you want to rack and stack. We need some of that. Because <laughs> um, we actually don't do that. We don't, we never supply servers. We could never scale if we were trying to supply servers. So we work with the, some of the larger conspicuous tech companies, some like friendly militaries, things like that. We work with in order to put their servers into water, but we just don't, we just don't have our own. And maybe, in time that will change but it's definitely not on my roadmap just now yeah very cool yeah so we're getting down towards the end of the show is there anything you'd like to discuss before we conclude um 
there's so much I didn't talk about. We didn't talk about AI. We didn't talk about sustainability. Um, no, I yeah, think let's go ahead. We can get, okay. we can get into it. We've got, we've got time. We can make Which time. one? Because I'm negative on both. Uh, sustainability. Okay, fine. So I think one of the last things I said is that um, we sort of need like shared acknowledgement of the realities that we have today, which is to say that like we are completely dependent on fossil fuel still. And it's a dependency that is increasing, not decreasing. And there's just no near instant shift away from it. We can't, we can't do it. And we should sort of focus our attention towards those sorts of things. But what we're really seeing is companies that are saying they are green or saying they're better from the, for the environment that are in. And if we look at like EVs, I think in 20 years time, they'll play back this podcast and they'll they'll hear me say at the start, I'm not smart. And then they'll play this back and they're like, maybe she was. But mm -hmm. basically I think EVs are like one of the worst things that we can do to our planet. If you split sustainability into these two categories of local sustainability and like planetary, a local level, they're great. I live in Los Angeles. The noise pollution is down. The actual pollution is probably down. There are some really good things about EVs, but on a planetary scale, they're really almost as bad as fossil fuel consuming cars. If you take a Tesla, a Tesla and a Hummer, put them side by side through the build out to driving it for a hundred miles, the Hummer is far more green, is actually far more sustainable than the Tesla but we're not talking about those things. And it makes it really hard for companies like mine where we, you know, we truly believe we're steadfast in this belief that we have a sustainable solution, but it's not almost like not flashy enough. It's almost too innovative. It's not incremental. People don't recognize it. The Tesla sort of just looks like another car, whereas a data center underwater is a huge step. So what we find is that by not acknowledging the actual realities of the world, the situation, how we build sustainability at different levels, it almost like dissuades other people and companies from taking the right actions. Like it, it, it goes against us all. Um, and we can, we probably shouldn't, but you know, brings us to like things like nuclear, where there's nimbyism and it's prolific mm -hmm. and it's encumbering. It's like really just not good. Um, but we need nuclear. There's nothing else that can supply gigawatts at the scale that we required. If we all want to take a step back in luxury in terms of air conditioning and devices and everything else that you live with, then yeah, we 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 can maybe use wind, but actually or solar. But it's simply just like not feasible to use those things just now. And I say that out of love for the renewable energy like ecosystem we like to co-locate with solar, uh, not solar, well, solar too, but wind farms. Because the problem that everyone has or wind farm owners and asset owners have is that you can't circumvent the attenuation and you can't circumvent the um, storage challenges so you need to use the power as it's generated and we sort of do that but it's again hard to educate the public on that because that's just not what we're told that's that's like not the message that we're getting from our elected officials it's not the message that we're getting from I guess social media so sustainability is like a very tricky subject um, and like the, I promise the final thing I'll say on it is, that's okay. Um, you know, uh, who is Warren Buffett's? He's called Charlie Munger. That's his name, right? Uh, Warren Buffett's sure. business partner, I think, is his name. And he said something really important, which is makes it all the worse that I messed up his name. But he said, "If you show me the incentives, I'll show you the outcome." And there's just no incentive to use the like our commodities efficiently from water so in our data centers we don't use any water the average data center uses between three to five million gallons of water per day and half of that is estimated to be potable water we have a severe 
worrying war shortage the world over like there already isn't enough water for people to drink safely and we're pumping it into data centers Mm -hmm. so like there's no incentive really we're not seeing it there's no incentive to use water efficiently if water was taxed or put up in price to like show how important it really is we'd all be a lot more careful with it and we saw the same like between the 30s and the 70s car engines became way less efficient because fuel was so cheap like that's Mm -hmm. not smart and today they're the cars are more efficient but fuel is still cheap and it just it's relative to the the negative externality so sustainability is like a topic i'm probably too down in the weeds on talk too much about it's (laughs) it's very interesting and sad how quickly yeah humans have destroyed or put so much damage up to yeah. the planet. And yeah. when you figure industrial revolution to now, that's not a lot of time no, to, it's to not. cause that kind of damage. It's really not. And it's not plateauing. You know, we're, we're yeah. growing in population and there's a really, really good book. It's by Vaclav Smeal. It's called How the World Really Works. It's one of my absolute favorite books. And I think it almost should be required reading. But basically he talks about what you've just talked about what i've just talked about and even like feeding the world is reliant on fossil fuels because we get ammonia from there and we need the ammonia to get the crop yields and to feed the animals and things like this like fossil fuel in and of itself we are reliant on and always every single way and we have this this backlash going against and i'm not saying that we shouldn't be looking for innovation to move away from it i just think we should be truthful with the population about what it really means, what would really have to happen, how quickly it can happen, those sorts of things. It is really interesting. You are right. We've not done a good job caring for the planet at all. And I think another thing too is sharing the innovation, you know, globally is good because you think about other innovators, scientists, people yeah. going to going to the universities, maybe if they had an idea of the truth that maybe they could be the yeah. one that comes up with these innovations. Exactly. And, you know, I, um, I follow the scientific community closely and respect everything that they have to say, essentially. And I love that science changes, you know, you can talk to people who might not have the, a strong belief in the scientific system. I enjoy that things change and that we learn more as we go. And every experiment leads to a new theory, to a new experiment, to so on and so on. So on it never sort of ends. Um, so I, I, I also listen to that community. Very cool. Very interesting. I really didn't know you were all into into that. Um, uh, so it's I, I learned a lot from this, even okay, good. along with your business. So I think it's really cool. And I think yeah. it's really going to be inspiring to others just to kind of see and, and really uh, awesome that, you know, you've started this business because i mean it's interesting because in my opinion because i i haven't done either one but to me starting a business like a consulting company just seems like so much easier than what you're doing now because you're doing a thing you don't have to have inventory you got your computer if you're doing social engineering you don't you're not gonna need a lot there but startup expense and and doing that and and finding customers for that would be relatively easy than something you come out with is that's you know something totally new innovative trying to get people to buy into that, you know, and, and getting funding and all that to start a company yeah. like that. It's all problem solving and you, you know, you have some, either you already have the skill to begin solving the problem or you want to learn the skill to begin solving the problem. And I happen to be this weird intersection of um, like n- knowing about subsea engineering, being interested in sustainability and liking to problem solve so maybe it's unique but that everyone that's that's the definition right we're all sort of we all have this different mindset these different experiences so you have to just find the problem you're going to solve whether it's in consulting or engineering or whatever it is it's definitely possible for people i don't want the pressure of of seeming of seeming like i'm smart or special (laughs) i think (laughs) i don't don't do that to me (laughs) but yeah (laughs) Well, thanks for sharing the, your your background because, like I said before, yeah. earlier, there's some people 
and this is everyone has some level of talent or gift that they naturally learn yes. things or they're just a natural at this. Some people, it's just a lot more work. Some people, you know, have the grit and the grind to be successful. And it's interesting to yeah. see how those work. So it's, it's great that you're transparent on, you know, you did this based on your life experiences. You've, you know, you've, you've put in the hard work and effort to get to where you're at. And so I think yeah. that's very, Thank very you. inspiring. And for anyone like male or female, I know we talked a little bit at the start about what it takes to be a female in some male dominated industries, but male or female, reach out to the smartest people you know, if you don't get the right answers there, like reach out to other people online. I think the online community, like Twitter, our community on Twitter, all you have to do is write what you think is the wrong answer and they'll correct you and you'll get the right answer <laughs> immediately. Um, That's a good point. <laughs> but just or reach out to people that you think are smart, even if they aren't in your circle and, and start to find some of the right answers. You'll piece it together by yourself, you know, over time. Very good. Thanks for joining. I appreciate you taking the time thank out of your busy you. schedule. I know you're probably playing catch up from summer camp. So thank yes, you. <laughs> not at all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you in the next.